You're probably getting fooled by data on a daily basis, and you don't even realize it. But by the end of this video, you'll be able to think like a data scientist, telling facts from nonsense and gaining a greater level of mastery over your own mind than the vast majority of people. I'm going to condense my years of statistical knowledge as a published academic into three essential skills you need to cut through the noise, spot flawed reasoning, and which together form a powerful system for clear thinking on a daily basis. Starting with skill number one data interpretation. So if you're anything like me, you probably often find yourself scrolling through social media, reading some blogs or watching some YouTube video, and you come across some statistical claim. And you know what I mean. X percent of people think this or that about Y. This study showed that A causes B and so forth. But how exactly are you supposed to tell fact from nonsense or truth from propaganda? Well, I'm going to make it super simple for you. For each of these skills, I'm going to give you key questions to ask when you're presented with certain kinds of information. Questions that will instantly help you think more intelligently and make you impossible to manipulate. So then, what do I mean by data interpretation? Well, just a few days ago, I saw this post while scrolling through my social media feed. And on its face, can you tell what's wrong with it? Well. It's not the claim itself that's necessarily wrong here. After all, the claim here could be accurate, or it might not be. Instead, it's the subtle forms of manipulation the creator of this post has employed in order to convince you, consciously or not. And so this poster will fool most people, but you, you won't be fooled because you'll ask the following key questions. Questions you can apply to pretty much every claim of this type that's posted online. One. Are these samples randomized and how many people were sampled? Two, are the dollar amounts nominal, as in raw dollar amounts, or are they real, as in adjusted for cost of living? Three, is income alone a valid measure of wealth, or should we take into account state benefits individuals receive that are not included in the income number? Four, are the differences observed in these samples statistically significant? And five, are these averages subject to Simpson's paradox? There are actually even more questions we could ask here, such as how was the category AI developer defined here? And as you can imagine, you can ask endless questions about data, but let's keep this simple and take a look at a few of these questions in more depth. For question number one here, randomization simply refers to how the samples were collected. For instance, notice here the weird comparison. The poster picked out a specific role at a specific company in a specific state and compared it to a general role in two different countries. This is bizarre and clearly biased to say the least. If we truly wanted a representative and therefore accurate sampling in order to compare the true salaries of certain jobs, we wouldn't simply want to compare the salary of in and out managers in California where the cost of living and therefore salaries are higher than usual. We would instead compare the average salary of a fast food restaurant manager across the entire United States to AI developers across these respective countries. The comparison this poster presents then is not aimed at revealing the truth. It's aimed at manipulating you into believing the conclusion that, quote, Europe is in structural decline, whatever that means. But that's not even the biggest problem here. To understand why, let's look at question four again. And to illustrate why this question is so important, let me ask you something. What if I got 2,000 students together, had them register to attend a university, and then I tracked how many were male and how many were female, and found that 38% were male and 62% were female? Could I then conclude from this the following? 38% of students who attend universities are male and 62% are female. Hopefully you said no. But you see, this fact still doesn't change if I increase the number to 20,000 students or even 2 million students in order to know whether these percentages are what statisticians call the true population parameter, or in other words, the true percentage of breakdown of male versus female students, I have to do what's called a hypothesis test and determine how likely the result of 38% male and 62% female is in a particular sample. Sure, the bigger the sample size, the more accurate the data tend to be, but no matter what, you can never really just trust some raw data number thrown out there. Not, that is, without doing a hypothesis test. So the bottom line here, never trust some raw percentage someone throws at you. Without further analysis, that number itself is meaningless. But what about number five here, Simpson's paradox? 
Well, since this idea also applies to our second skill, we'll discuss it with skill number two, model interpretation. So what is model interpretation and how is it different from data interpretation? Well, to understand that, we have to first understand what a model is. A model is essentially an equation or set of equations that when combined with data, give us some more or less accurate prediction. For instance, gravity is a model. When we drop a rock from an airplane, and please don't do this, it's just an example, it will drop at an acceleration of 9.8 meters per second squared. And if we want a statistically accurate model of this, we will also factor in its mass as well as wind resistance. All of these factors are, in a sense, what make up the model of our stone falling from the sky. And using this model, we can predict pretty much exactly when and where it will hit the ground. So in other words, models are pretty damn useful for making predictions about the world. But gravity is one thing. What about phenomena such as depression, intelligence, or democracy? These are fuzzy concepts, and their vagueness and openness to interpretation make them especially problematic and prone to manipulation. We hear people making claims about these fuzzy and vague concepts every day, and if you don't understand which questions to ask when people present you with claims about these models, you'll be easily fooled and manipulated. Unlike gravity, which can be measured directly and in some units, these kinds of phenomena I mentioned before, such as depression, intelligence, democracy, and more, they're what are called latent variables, and as such can be measured only by using a statistical method called structural equation modeling, as well as some other approaches. Now, I have an entire video that goes into much more detail on structural equation modeling as it applies to measuring intelligence, which you can check out at the video card above, so I won't go into tons of detail as to how these models are constructed and analyzed. Instead, let's once again focus on the key questions you want to ask about these types of models when they're presented to you. One, which model of this phenomenon is being measured here? Two. What are the mathematical constraints of the model? Three, is the model causal or simply correlational? And four, what are the normative assumptions, if any, in the model? Let's take a closer look at each of these questions, and for the sake of example, we'll use the concept of happiness. Now, happiness is a great concept to explore for our purposes, because people have been debating the nature of happiness for millennia, and there are lots of useful models for measuring happiness that have been developed, such as the sustainable happiness model, eudaimonic models, the utility model, and researchers have come up with various metrics, such as the Gini coefficient, quality-adjusted life years, and gross national happiness to measure happiness in economic contexts. And this is precisely why asking question number one here is so important. Because let's say someone makes the following claim. The implementation of a universal basic income policy will create greater overall well-being and happiness for individuals in country X. Well, which model of happiness among the many we've mentioned are they referring to here? Do you see why failing to ask this question could lead you to buy into beliefs that are founded on potentially flawed, hidden assumptions, even if the claim is based on good data? But what about number two here about the mathematical constraints of the model? And how about that previous question number five we talked about with respect to what's called Simpson's paradox? Well, let's discuss both together. And to understand why these questions are so important, let's briefly look at an entirely different variable that also can't be directly measured namely learning. One of the metrics used to measure learning is what's called the learning rate, or essentially the rate at which an individual learns. However, there's significant ongoing debate about which of two dominant models should be used, what's called the power law model, or what's called the exponential model. As you can see, the equations representing these two models are quite different, and both models seem to predict outcomes pretty well. However, there are key limitations to what the mathematics of these models can tell us. You see, when researchers add together or aggregate all the data on individuals' learning patterns, one model seems to be more predictive and useful, namely the power law model. However, this starts to break down when we try to apply it to individuals. To predict individual learning patterns, it's often more useful to use the exponential model. But now, here's the issue. Each of these models leads us to different conclusions about reality. And those conclusions matter a lot. You see, if we simply look at the structure of each equation, we can see that the power law model implies that it's 
always possible to keep improving, even if slowly. Whereas the exponential model implies that there's a limit to how much you can improve. And don't you agree, these are very, very different conclusions? Well, the mathematical constraints of models become even more obvious when we examine Simpson's paradox, which is similar to, although not the same as, the problem we just examined with respect to these learning rate equations. To understand Simpson's paradox clearly, let's go back to our chart showing that the average AI developer in France makes $75,000 a year. Well, here's the thing. Just as in our learning rate example, that number might not actually reflect anyone's real experience. In fact, it's possible that no individual developer actually earns exactly $75,000 a year. As we've seen, that's yet another reason to be skeptical of raw averages. But here's where it gets wild. Suppose PhD holders in Paris earn more than master's grads, and the same is true in rural France. PhDs earn more in both places. But when you combine the data from both regions, it suddenly looks like master's grads earn more overall. That's Simpson's paradox, a situation where the trend in every group reverses when the groups are averaged together. But these sorts of issues are just the tip of the iceberg. There are all sorts of mathematical constraints on models of these types that place limits on what we can and cannot conclude. Yet that doesn't stop influencers, commentators, and other ideologically motivated individuals from making broad, sweeping claims using these models that the makers of these models most likely wouldn't even claim themselves. Don't worry though, you don't need to know everything about models to think intelligently about them. Simply start asking these questions the next time you hear any claim about a model, and you'll be far less likely to fall into the mental traps of today's ideologically motivated content. But what about question four here? Well, it's precisely by asking question four that we begin to master our third skill on this list, a skill that ties this entire kind of thinking together, normative reasoning. Normativity is simply the study of value judgments, which happens to be the exact field I've published in. But what does this have to do with data or model interpretation? Well, consider for a moment that almost every piece of data you're presented with has an agenda attached to it. It's presented to you to convince you to buy something or to join some group or increasingly to admire certain people and hate others. And so whether we're talking about happiness, democracy, economic growth, intelligence, or any of these types of abstract latent variables, the key questions you should always ask when presented with them are the following. One, why was this model created? Or what were the original motivations of the model's creator? Two, what variables have been included in the model? Which ones have been excluded and why? And three, how did the models get their names? Questions one and two speak to the motivations and value systems of the model's creators, but what's up with question three here? It's a pretty odd question, right? Actually, this is precisely the question I've raised in my academic work. In my book, Rationality, Virtue, and Liberation, I devote a section of a chapter to examining assumptions in a popular decision-making model called rational choice theory. As I've argued, the decision to name this theory rational choice theory has certain consequences. Namely, it has the effect of labeling and therefore presuming certain outcomes as rational and therefore labeling and presuming as irrational any other outcomes. Do you see any potential problems with this? Well, if the theory were truly neutral, purely predictive and nothing else, the theory would be called something like typical choice theory or x-choice theory. You see, while the physical sciences do a fairly good job of staying relatively value neutral in the naming of things such as gravity, force, etc., which have no clear normative connotations, the cognitive and social sciences diverge significantly in this respect. Simply by naming an empirically objective phenomenon by some pre-existing name containing various normative connotations, the word intelligence, for instance, is a great example, researchers implicitly and mostly unknowingly stake a normative claim similar to the one I've discussed regarding the word rational in rational choice theory. In my opinion, the social sciences and cognitive sciences should strive to be a bit more like physics in the sense of going back perhaps to calling intelligence by its original technical name g-factor, democracy for instance by some technical name factor d perhaps, and economic growth simply by factor e and so on. But as always, feel 
free to disagree with me. The bottom line is, hold these questions close to you. Never stop asking them when you're presented with data or models, and keep striving to make yourself a truly independent thinker. If you want to keep leveling up your critical thinking to make a massive impact not only on your own life, but also on the lives of countless others, then be sure to watch this next video.